Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you all so much for coming out tonight. My name is Bex. I am on the events team at Books Are Magic, and we're so excited uh, to celebrate the release of the Goth House Experiment with S.J. Sindhu and Tony Amato. Uh, round of applause for our lovely guests. Um, before we get into that, for sure, I want to uh, point out just a few logistics for tonight. We'll be doing a hand-raised Q&A uh, with the audience tonight, so think of your questions. Hold on to them tight. We will get them answered at the end of the talk. Afterwards, uh, Cindy will be signing books in the back. Uh, we will point out where we will come around with post-it notes to get the spelling of your names so you can get them personalized, and it's going to be great and lovely, and we'll let you know when to do that. If you're joining us virtually via the live stream, uh, click on that link in the YouTube description to buy your books. If you're here with us, buy your books. Uh, you already bought your books? Buy more of them. Um, buy our whole stock. We would love that. We would adore that. It would be amazing. Um, yeah, so uh, tonight's star of the show, the book you're all going to buy later, uh, The Goth House Experiment, is an uncanny and electric story collection that depicts shocking cruelty as readily as it does queer joy. From an English professor finding fame on TikTok to a young poet haunted by Oscar Wilde, this collection examines our need for fulfillment and connection in a continually changing world. S.J. Sindhu, tonight's author extraordinaire, is a Tamil diaspora, diaspora, well, I do that every time, sorry, diaspora writer whose works include the novels Marriage of a Thousand Lives, Blue Skin Gods, which again we have tonight, uh, the graphic novel Shakti and the chat books I met you. I once met you, but you were dead. And dominant genes. They have many awards for their work and hold a PhD in English and creative writing from Florida State University. Tony Amato, tonight's conversation partner, is a writer and has been a writing consultant for more than 30 years. He has likewise received many awards, both for his writing and for his activism. He lives in Kingston with his wife. Without any further delay, please join me once again in welcoming S.J. Sindhu and Tony Amato. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you to Books Are Magic, um, which is the best title. Uh, best title? Best name for a show? Yeah, yeah, for a bookstore. Um, and thank you all for coming. Uh, I, didn't, I didn't know which story I was going to read when I landed this morning. Um, and I was walking around Manhattan, and I... Like, I'm from a lot of places. I moved around a lot as a kid, so I never really think of myself as from somewhere. But I always feel like I'm from Boston when I'm in New York. <laughs> so, <laughs> so because of that, um, I am going to read the only story in this collection that was conceived of, written, and set in Boston. It's called Patriot's Day. Four days before his death, Amit Srinivasan files for divorce. He's living in a tiny apartment in Somerville that he began renting in December, ever since his wife packed a suitcase full of his clothes and burned it in the backyard fire pit of their suburban brick house. Winter has broken, and Somerville's tree-lined streets rupture with color. Pink petals work their way into the cracked, uneven sidewalks. As soon as Amit files for divorce, he calls Hannah. She doesn't pick up. He leaves her a voicemail. We can be together now, he says. I love you, he says. I filed for divorce, he says. But four days pass, and Hannah doesn't call back. At 8.10 p.m. on April 15th, a woman named Panela Robertson will push Amit in front of an orange line train at the Forest Hills, tea, Forest Hills tea Stop in Boston. She will be frustrated, and all it'll take is a little shove, a couple of pounds of pressure. Amit will already be over the line, standing with his toes butting into the yellow markings on the platform. He will be leaning forward, looking into the tunnel as the headlights fill the empty stone void, the light rushing closer, and Pamela will put out her arm and shove him in the back, her fingernails scraping against his trench coat. And he will hang there, slanted, poised between death and the platform. Pamela will be able to picture it, Years later, the way his body will hang diagonal between the platform and the yellow line, the way the tunnel will fill with light, the way the rumbling train will carry him off 
like a leaf. When police officers ask her why she did it, she won't tell them. Pamela will feel her skin, the clothes over them, the air around her and the officers. This is what she will know, that she has a chip in one of her nails from the blending machine she operates at Tony's chocolate factory, that there are 1.82 ounces of white chocolate in each almond macaroon they make, that she needs her roots touched up where the gray is starting to shine, that her appointment is on April 16th at 4 p.m. with Amanda, that she is wearing the wrong type of shoes, that for her flat feet she should really wear sneakers when she stands at the machines all day, but she can't bring herself to give up her polished leather penny loafers like her mother used to wear. On the morning of his death, Amit heaves himself out of bed and turns on the TV in his tiny Somerville apartment. The red line rumbles beneath the floorboards. He looks around and thinks that he needs to get a clock. He could get some plants or a picture frame to hang over the white spot on the wall where someone had patched over a hole and neglected to paint it. He could make a home here. He could be happy. I'll stop there. Thank you. It was heavy, sorry. <laughs> is mine on? Yeah, it is. Okay, everyone can clap. You can do that. That's allowed. <laughs> Okay, so I'm supposed to start off the conversation, so I guess I have permission to kind of like, uh -huh. um, I want to say that, specific to the story you just heard, and please do buy the book, and please do buy lots of books, because independent bookstores, you know, and like authors who are actually writing stories that matter. But hearing it out loud, I've read it a couple times, right? Hearing it out loud, I'm particularly struck by... Um, ruthlessness with which you like call Pamela out for who she is and what's awful about what she's done but with never using an adjective or an adverb or any kind of rhetoric to explain the awfulness but to just let it be as mundane as it you know the the beauty of how she experiences this man's death takes my breath away every time and that what she's thinking about is her nails and I, I think I, I just want to compliment the mastery of that and Thank I think you. that when, when, you, when, you, when you get the book and read all the way through, one of the things that strikes me you do really well is um, this portrayal of the horrific that's beautiful. So I'm just curious, like, how do you, I mean, you're young compared to me, right? Where do you, where do you find the, the ability to write beautifully about enraging and horrific things? I think it's, if I didn't poeticize it, it would be hard to write about. You know, cruelty is always hard to write about. Um, and pain is hard to write about. And it's hard to be there as a writer because you have to hold it all in your head while you're writing. And making it beautiful or focusing on how objectively it can be beautiful can cut that some somewhat, you know, can mitigate that somewhat. And I think it's really, you need to, uh, for me as a writer anyway, how I approach writing is I want the reader to feel the emotions. I don't want to tell the reader what to feel. I want to make them feel it. And just describing it. So when things are really painful, I tend to zoom out and uh, not have much emotion in the writing itself because I think the reader will supply that. And it's an inviting in of the reader to bring them into the story, to invite them to participate by processing with me. I can't give away the end of the story, but it's, <laughs> it's very true. Do you, do you ever think of that as like, um, I'm going to use insider language, editor, writers, but do you ever think of that as like a sucker punch? Like, oh, I'm going to lure a reader who might not want to look at this in by starting by being really lovely or beautiful language, lyric language, and then I'm going to say, pow, look at this? Yes. Um, I think of it as like kind of bringing the reader up or down. And um, I think some people, <laughs> when they write about pain or about difficult situations, will just have the down, the down, the down. And it, when that happens, what I think happens with the reader is that they become numb to it. 
they become numb to the pain, and so when thing you have to make things increasingly horrific. This is what happens with uh, happened, I think, with the Handmaid's t- uh, Tale uh, adaptation, is that there were no good parts. <laughs> you know, there's nothing good that happened, and so it was just all bad, all bad, all the time, and eventually the viewer just becomes completely numb to it and you can't make them feel anything. And so you have to make your characters go through increasingly awful things. But what you can do to make them feel is to bring them, bring, bring the emotion up. So make the reader feel elevated in some way, whether they're looking at, you know, listening to poetic language or we're focusing on something beautiful or even a moment of levity. And then you pull the rug out and let, let them drop down. And that's, to me, that's how I think about writing, um, is that you have to control the reader's experience. And I always say that um, a master writer can control the reader's experience completely. And that's, and, uh, that's kind of what I think every reader is striving for. You want to predict how the reader will respond. I'll call you a master writer. <laughs> <laughs> I was not Doctor fishing. Writer. I was not fishing. <laughs> well... Now I want to know who you think is a master writer, but I don't know if you're allowed to say that. Can I ask you who, like, yeah. who, who was in your lineage of like who you'd like to be with? Uh, I think Percival Everett is really, really good at that. Where um, he's he's able to uh, give you cruelty because he has moments of comedy and levity in his prose and so there's like in every scene there's a moment and then he just drops you and it, you feel it. Um, Jeanette Winterson does this, James Baldwin does this very well, Oscar Wilde does it really well um, which is why I, I he became pitch, a... Pitch, pitch, <laughs> pitch. There's a, yeah, there's an Oscar Wilde ghost story that um, may, might be my favorite because it was the more, most fun to write. I've read Blue Skin Gods. Has anyone here read Blue Skin Gods already? So, right? So, and it strikes me in Blue Skin Gods that you have a whole novel to do mm-hmm. that up and down, up and down that you're yeah. talking about. And there are very funny moments and there are really beautiful moments mm-hmm. and there are devastating moments, right? These are very short, short stories mm-hmm. on the whole. Um, what was the challenge of trying to create those emotional moments and still kind of kind of keep the the rhythm of the story going and still talk about what you really want to talk about? Um, well, it takes me a long time to write a short story. It takes me <laughs> months and maybe years to write a short story. How long did the last story take? <laughs> <laughs> like, oh God, this, this, everything in this is at least, took me at least a year, if not 10, 14 years to write some of them. Um, so I write them like novels. Uh, Patriot's Day, which I read, actually I thought was going to be a novel. I wrote half a novel and then realized it didn't have the energy to be a novel, so I pulled it back and condensed it into a short story. Um, but I think that's the that's my process. Like I just write everything like it's a novel, and then just like you know hone it down and hone it down, and hone it down, and and by so doing, kind of like you know make a sculpture just chipping, chipping, chipping away. Do you miss anything that you took out when you had something that was half novel and then it ends up? Oh, uh, there, there was just, there was a lot about Amit that, and his life, um, his, you know, interiority. It was a very like heady, just like a man walking through a city kind of novel, like a Flaneur novel. Um, which I think I could write now, but at that time I didn't have the skill to write that novel, and so I it, the energy just petered out. Um, but maybe I'll write it someday. I really hope anyone in the room who's writing is hearing some of this, like really <laughs> loud and clear, right? Because I think, like, so we met a while ago, right? So I knew you when you were kind of like starting at this, and I think that that watching the progression and being as prolific as you have been. And as successfully prolific, right? It's not that it's just that this five, six books, it's that the five, six highly polished, really well thought out, stylistically well executed, et cetera, et cetera. And yeah, I'm singing praises, mm-hmm. but it's all true. Um, the process of getting to that level of excellence in a story 
um, did the MFA program help you with that? Did the PhD um, help you learn those skills? It did. I think these, you know, th and, and a lot of students, because I'm in academia, a lot of students ask me, you know, should I get a MFA? Should I get a PhD? And I always say that you will learn these things anyway. That's not the only way to learn. But that, you know, those two years of concentrated work where you're surrounded by writing community and you're the only thing, your only job is really to write and to read and to think about all that stuff. Um, to give yourself that time, especially if you go to a fully funded program where your tuition is paid for and they're giving you a stipend to teach, um, is, is you're gonna learn things faster. It's just a fast track. You, I, you know, I would have figured this stuff out, but probably not in the time that I figured it out. Um, and then I, you know, your workshop was, so Tony ran a workshop in Boston where I actually wrote, or they wrote the beginnings of two of these stories. And, um, yeah. You came for the cookies. I, 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 no, I came for the soup. <laughs> so I'm gonna, I'm, I'm probably, I might get this attribution wrong, so forgive me, my brain doesn't always go well, but in a, in a book that came out in the 80s uh, called um, Women Writing, it was all these different women authors talking about their writing, and so the book might be wrong, but there was an interview with Endozaki Shange, and in it she talks about um, the villains in her stories, and she says, I don't make bad guys just to punish them. Like, the thing you have to understand is I do not make, I could, and obviously she could, um, and she talks about partly because she has to live with them, right, for the duration of writing it, but also that she had to, other goals around that. So I'm curious, because there are a lot of bad people in this collection doing very bad things, as we just read. Um, so what's your relationship with you know, the, the bad people, the antagonists? The I think everyone's a hero in their own story. And I think in order to write a good villain or a good character of any sort, the writer has to love them regardless. And that has been hard to learn or to find my way to loving some of these awful, you terrible people. You love Pamela? People. In some way, yes. I feel bad for her. I feel bad for her. Um, her daughter doesn't talk to her anymore. She is isolated and lonely and her husband's dad like, has died and she's sad. She's sad and she's using that sadness as anger. Okay, this is an amazing moment for me because I think Pamela is loathsome. <laughs> she is. Oh, she very much is. If she if she were a real person, I would not talk to her. Um, but she's not a real person. She's my creation, and so because of that, and when I encounter her in fiction, in other people's fiction, I hate those characters. Um, but I think for me, like the like the utter awful father figure in Blue Skin Gods, is. Uh, as much of a villain as I've ever written, but like he has his own reasons for doing things, and you know I don't I don't like I I don't like the redemption arc for a villain either, you know where like it's like well he's evil because and I'm like no nothing is an explanation or an excuse for being evil, um, so I guess I like my villains because <laughs> I have to <laughs> if I don't they don't they feel wooden. That's interesting because, right, so it sounds like it's okay if I loathe her. Yeah. But, but there's also this piece of, like, humanity, so I can't completely otherwise her. Mm -hmm. Because in another life, I, I mean, I can't be Pamela, but I could have been Pamela mm -hmm. in another life, right? What about your tertiary characters, like the boyos at the bar? So um, many writers really yeah. struggle with tertiary characters. I think, I, I, I don't know who said this to me, but one of my writing teachers told me that I should have, like, a one distinctive thing about a tertiary character that doesn't matter. Like, mm. the character doesn't matter. They're, they're like, I don't know, they're like passing the other person on the street. But that one distinctive detail will make them stand out. Um, and I, I think uh, somebody, like Tolstoy does this extremely well, where we just get all these, like, 
side characters who I'm like, why are we talking to these people? <laughs> like, who are these people? They don't matter. But they're so distinctive and they have their own personality. But it's really only because one or two lines of dialogue that they say or one or two details about them um, that really fleshes them out. Because our brains are really good at flushing things out. So you just have to give it two or three, like, hints. Ooh, pattern recognition mm -hmm. with your readers. Very yeah. nice. Do you like dialogue better than description or description better than dialogue, or is it a ridiculous question? <laughs> to write, not to read. I, I like, I find dialogue easier than description. Across the board, no matter who you're writing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I feel like I can hear the dialogue in my head, and it's always, it's never, it's never muddied for me. Whereas with description, I can fall into my writing habits where I have like these ticks where... True confessions, true confessions. Yeah. What's a tick? I, I, Your tick. <laughs> oh my gosh. I, I write a lot about... You were talking about like touch. Um, that I like retreat into the body, into like describing um, bodily sensations instead of naming emotions. And that's, that's a thing that I do in my writing. Sometimes it's good, but sometimes if I'm using it because I don't know how to name emotions, that's bad. So. Okay, I'm really <laughs> struck by that too because I think one <laughs> of the things that's, for me as a reader, one of the things that's really great about, and again, no spoilers, this collection is so much of how you let us in to people's interiority is through mm -hmm. the physicality of it or something as ridiculous as, you know, brewing microbrews. You don't get a lot of emotion talk in there. We just have, and then I can't say it because it's a spoiler, but then things that are created <laughs> end up being the metaphors for mm -hmm. the emotionality. And I think I read, I read a lot of Cinder's reviews coming here to get ready. And, you know, a lot of the reviews talked about a sort of um, a cool aesthetic that mm -hmm. you have. And I didn't experience it that way at all. I think that it's just, um, you don't say it outright. Yeah, a lot of my characters tend to be kind of withdrawn or, or, or at least uh, keep their emotions to themselves. Um, it comes out in their behavior, in their dialogue, in, their, in the things that they do, but they don't ever say, I am sad. Perhaps because, you know, I am, I like to think of myself as, a, as an, you know, I wear my heart on my sleeve, but I actually don't. I cry like twice a year, mm. if that. Um, I, I, I went through, I've been in therapy since I was 17, and it is only like in the last year that I told my therapist everything. And that's a long time to hide. I'm 35, it's a long time to hide things. And you saying everything is an understatement. Yeah, um, my, like everything about my past. Like I grew up in Sri Lanka during a civil war. And, um, you know, from the time I was born to the time I was seven, it was like an active battle zone. And I didn't th tell a therapist about that until only a couple of years ago. Even though it was, it, you know, it's, I dealt with some symptoms of PTSD, but I just, I don't know. I was like, you wouldn't understand. And I just never revealed it, which I think is dumb. But <laughs> don't do that. <laughs> it's dumb. <laughs> but, um, but like, I, I, I understand characters who don't want to be vulnerable in those ways. I also think that it protects the dignity of the character too, though, just from like a literary point of view, right? Like there's mm -hmm. a lot of fiction where more is given away about the character than the character themselves would. And I think one of the things I find you very versatile about is you can inhabit a lot of different voices and points of view and even ones that I would, from where I sit, imagine are profoundly uncomfortable for you and, and then to be able to inhabit that emotional space. Mm -hmm. That's not a question, but yes. And it's a compliment. <laughs> okay, thank you. Moderate the moderator. Well, you stopped <laughs> talking. I was like, what? I don't know what to say There's now. There's <laughs> the question. Um, I wanted to ask you about, um, because whiteness is not centered in this collection. Right. There's very little. And when it does show up, it shows up being called out, mm -hmm. which is beautiful. Is that on purpose? Yes. <laughs> I mean, also, um, I'm just, I think we need that. I need to, I, we need to decenter whiteness. 
And I think characters... <laughs> I think readers are now... White readers are more comfortable with that now than ever before. Oh, right, because when Ceremony came out... Mm, oh. Yeah, I mean, e yeah, ev like even when I was trying to publish my first works, um, it, they weren't getting taken. Marriage of a Thousand Lives. Yes, but also short work, um, you know, short essays or poems or anything because it didn't reflect. People, people associated, I can relate to this, to I like it. Mm -hmm. But I think popular discourse has now become sophisticated enough, weirdly. I don't know how we got here but become sophisticated enough where a lot of readers can separate those two things. So give me a year spread or a decade spread on um, that. Probably I'm talking like 2000, well maybe 2000 to now. It's about 20 years. And do you have stories that you had difficulty getting published, now getting acceptance? Yes, I had, so when I first started writing, I was writing a lot of nonfiction and um, a lot of like lyric essays in probably 2004, five, six, seven, and they, no one wanted them. No one wanted them. Um, and then like every once in a while, one person somewhere would decide. Uh, and usually that person was, you know, at that time, a white man who would like somehow get it in his head to be like, hey, we should publish this. Um, and so, so I, I would get some, you know, here and there, but it's only in the last few years that people are like rediscovering that old work and actually talking about it, which I'm like, oh, I guess it like it's relevant now somehow. Um, yeah, I don't know. It's it's it is a culture change, and I I don't know how it happened, especially considering how politics is going right now. Uh, yeah, but somehow you know we are here. <laughs> We are here. <laughs> I noticed that your book tour is going to some very specific places and mm -hmm. not others, though. Was that also a choice? Or, I mean, it might have been finances, but... I mean, partly it was... This is my publicist, Lily, <laughs> <laughs> who organized the book tour. Um, <laughs> no. Um, no, I mean, partly it's places that meant something to me, which is like, you know, the, the north eastern coast... Uh, places I've lived, that kind of stuff. Um, I'm, you know, not famous enough that I can just show up in a yeah, town and yeah, have these, yeah. uh, like, have people <laughs> just show up. Um, but you know, uh, yeah. So part of it is that, and part of it is that I didn't want to go to the South and tour with this book. I went to Florida State to read um, because it's my alma mater, but, and I'm going to University of Nebraska because that's where I graduated from. That's where I did my master's and my bachelor's degree. So, um, but I have a lot of people I, I love there. Uh, but yeah, no, otherwise I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna go <laughs> to like <laughs> Alabama and try to, try to sell this book. Do you read your reviews? Um, <laughs> I don't anymore. Yes, yes, you read the reviews. <laughs> Um, I do, I used to read the reviews and like, I think with this book I stopped. This is, this is, this is the end. This is when I stopped reading reviews. So why? Because I got my first bad review. <gasps> Who was it? We'll, we'll <laughs> kid him. I mean, <laughs> I, I've always gotten, you know, you always get bad reviews on like Goodreads and Amazon sometimes. And my favorite review was a, I think it was a three star review on Goodreads and all it said was it was dot 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 okay? <laughs> <laughs> That's it. I was like, I love that review. It was so non-committal, but they felt strongly enough to put it in there. <laughs> right, right. And three out of five. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> just okay. Um, so I I like love those types of reviews, um, but like an official review uh, where you know they they weren't feeling it. Did like, it ever okay. affect your writing? No. I think it just makes me angry. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, because I don't, it, it, it doesn't, the bad reviews never say anything that I feel is true. If they actually pointed out failures of my writing, I think, which I definitely have, because um, I've 
been in you know environments where I get workshopped regularly. <laughs> so I know that I have a lot of failures in my writing, but I the bad reviews never do that. Like with Shakti, I got a review where it was positive. It, that's my graphic novel. It was positive, except for the fact that they, the reviewer was like, well, you have to suspend disbelief that uh, wild violets, and, or violets and fiddleheads grow wild in New England. And I was like, but they do. <laughs> I, I lived there. They do. I, I used to collect them as a child. I don't know what you want. <laughs> And you can eat them, and they yeah. are tasty. Yeah, I was just so pissed because it was. I just, I, mm. <laughs> like it's those reviews where I'm like, and it's is an official review. I don't know. That's what bothers. That's what bothers. I know. <laughs> I don't know what I. D <laughs> <laughs> What's your favorite one in the book? What's your favorite story? I've got to say the Oscar Wilde. I love reading Patriot's Day because the, the cadence of I think because it was half of a novel and I squished it down, it's like every word has been, you know, kind of honed. Um, and I've spent time on it. But uh, my favorite is the Oscar Wilde story because um, he's so sassy. Uh, and I got to write Oscar Wilde as a character and he's so sassy. I mean, he's not sassy in real life, but... Um, yeah, so all of every word of that he says is either a direct quote from his work or a, a mashup of the things that he has said, or I just made it up because I think it's something he would say. And that was just really fun to write. And he's just mean. He's, he's haunting this, this, uh, this white dude who wants to be a poet and he's just graduated from his MFA and he's like walking through, he's inherited this house and he's walking through this giant house and Oshawa's just like following him around, telling him that he, he will never be a good poet. <laughs> and it's just fun. It was fun to write. <laughs> this was where we revealed that your partner is a poet. Yes, <laughs> he is a poet. <laughs> he is a white dude and he's a poet. That is true. See, no, that's interesting, too, because I love that story because I feel like it's like a big to every self-indulgent like writer who's not sitting down yes. and doing their work kind of thing. Yeah, yes. I said it. I, I, I went to school with a lot of people who were um, who liked the idea of writing, I think, more than writing itself. And I don't know. That's not how you be a writer. I also, if you are not aware of the word bro it, I want you to know it. <laughs> I give this to you. Bro it. it. <laughs> we just stirred the wasp mess. <laughs> we just stirred the wasp. And Bex is telling me it's time to start taking questions, I think. Do you have a format for that? Do people need to come up anywhere? Or? Raise your hand. And please speak really clearly because I have 55-year-old ears and I have to repeat your question. That is not old. I didn't say old. You did. <laughs> you read out of Patriot's Day, Patriot's Day. Uh, Patriot's Day is uh, present tense and future tense in, in the way that you chose to tell the story, which I find, as a reader, really interesting mm -hmm. um, because it feels very uncomfortable. And I'm curious as to um, why you chose to do that versus the way that a lot of a lot of stories that we tell each other, we often tell in the past tense. Mm -hmm. um, why, why did you choose to, to tell it that way? Okay, so I'm going to paraphrase. Um, for the YouTube, people on YouTube, um, you're asking why Sindhu chose to sort of go back and forth between present tense and past tense? Present, no, and, pres future. present and future. And not past. And not past. I think Patriot's Day was a story where, you know, it, it, it's a man living his last day, and I wanted it to be uncomfortable, and I wanted it to be immediate. And the way to make it immediate is like, you know, I couldn't tell it in first person. Uh, so that would be another way to make it immediate. But um, I couldn't do that, so I chose present tense. And it, I think it, 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 all, it was always in present tense. I've never, um, sometimes I change the tense around on stories, but this is kind of just how it came. Uh, from the beginning, it was 
present and then we flash forward to his death and then we go back and we're still in the present and we follow him all the way and then I'll, yeah, I won't tell you what happens. <laughs> Do you feel like your writing is, like, who is the audience for? Is your writing for the people on the fence, is it for the crowd, or the choir? Is it for people on the other side of the fence? And how does that, like, change how you write? Because I think all of those are valid reasons to write, or val valid perspectives to take in your writing. But I just want to hear your perspective. So again, I'm going to paraphrase, so tell me if I get it wrong. Um, that asking Sindhu your sort of positionality and intentionality uh, specifically around like political issues. Mm -hmm. Like who do I write for? That's right. Um, I think I'm mostly very aware of the power of representation and making people feel seen who have never been seen, centering identities that have never been centered. And for me, that's who I'm writing for. The person who has never really seen themselves as the main character. And I want to give that experience because it took me so long to find books where, and stories where people looked like me <laughs> and had my experiences and had my, um, you know, and, and, and now I think it exists more than ever. South Asian literature is growing, but not fast enough. And it's dominated by kind of, I don't know, Indian and Pakistani narratives, but also very specific kinds of narratives, specific kinds of caste and class and um, sexuality and gender narratives. So I want to diversify that. Um, and Mala, you know, you're doing the good work as well, <laughs> another South Asian queer writer. Um, but yeah, it's, it's for the people who have never really had that in their lives. And I think that's powerful. And so it's not really for you know, the average reader, whoever that might be. Um, it's more for the choir <laughs> than not. Again, if I mess it up, correct me. Um, because you have because you have stories set in in South Asian. How do you pick the settings, or what are you exploring with the settings? Yeah, South Asian characters in different settings. Okay. Does that allow her to explore with the characters? Did that come through? Um, yeah. So I have I usually change setting quite a lot, um, and I think that's because I've lived in a lot of places, and I I want to reflect that and I want to um, be true to that experience of being displaced. And I have to say I've never really felt at home in one place or another. Um, I always always feel a little bit displaced. And I think that's, that's a normal experience for people who've immigrated. Um, and also probably people who have actually been displaced by war or other things. Uh, but I also want to acknowledge and represent and celebrate the fact that South Asians are everywhere <laughs> and they are, yeah, um, we don't exist in a particular uh, lane or a particular place and um, there's a lot of diversity within our culture and within our diasporas. Um, and different diasporas have evolved in different ways and they have different politics and I still haven't, written, I'm trying to write about Toronto now. And Toronto is a place that is just wild because it's so different in how the South Asian culture works there. Um, there's just there's a ridiculous amount of South Asian people in Toronto. But that also means that there are divisions. Um, there are divisions based on where you're from or what language you speak or um, what, you know, what, uh, yeah, what caste you are, um, what nationality you are. As a Tamil person, 
here in the US, I am lumped in with, uh, you know, all South Asians, I think, we're just kind of lumped together into one thing. And we are read as, you know, doctors and engineers and lawyers and um, taxi drivers <laughs> and people who run gas stations. Uh, but then you cross the border into Toronto and you are no longer South Asian, you are Tamil and you are Sri Lankan Tamil specifically. And that means a very particular thing in Toronto. Mm. And that is really fascinating to me. Like I've seen my cousins have a lot, get a lot of discrimination from other members of the South Asian community um, because they are like brown Tamil men. Mm. And so that that kind of thing is really fascinating to me, how we police each other and how I've written about how in the queer community we police each other and um, do various kinds of violence uh, toward each other but I haven't really done that in the in the South Asian community and I really want to. Uh, have you thought about taking any of the stories in your latest book and making them like adaptations for TV or movies? Ooh, are you taking anything and turning it into a television show? Uh, no, not in this story. I don't, I think I get bored easily. And so when, I, when I've done something, I'm like, ah, eh, it's done. That story <laughs> is gone. It's dead to me. And I'm just on to the next thing. I am um, trying to write for television, but I want to write about a very specific thing. I want to write about 2005 in Nebraska, being a queer activist in that very particular place mm -hmm. and what that was like in a time when college students were writing argumentative essays about whether or not gay people should have rights at all and you know what it what it meant to have be an activist at a time when your very humanity was being debated as a hot topic in you know in mainstream culture welcome back yeah yeah we're just recycling it um, but i think that's why it's making me think about it a lot and that's why it's making me think it's timely and it important to talk about because we're like we are just repeating it and we haven't done enough clearly thinking and processing through that Ooh, time so many questions but i have to let other people ask them <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for saying that. <laughs> Can you imagine filming the subway scene? Oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> Did you just shut down a tea station in Boston to film that? Yeah. Easy. They're always that shut down, down anyway. Really you can just let go. <laughs> <laughs> they are shut down anyway. <laughs> How are we doing on time? I'm, I'm going to start hogging more? you with. Yeah. Um, I, thank you for your question. Because I'm always curious about, um, you know, placing people in situations where they have to code switch, to mm -hmm. use a shorthand for it, right? And how that brings out different things from different characters. Right? I think we're like Dorothy Allison writing about class and queer code switching. I think about a lot of your stories, there are moments of code switching mm -hmm. with, with moms and children. And mm -hmm. you Christy, don't use that word, although I bet you do when you're teaching. Yeah. Um, how that plays out on a, on, a, on a fiction level, trying to get that across and make those the moments of tension. I think it's difficult to, the, the thing I struggle with most is to make the stakes clear. So with uh, Marriage of a Thousand Lies, my first book, where it was about a young woman trying to come out to her family, I had so many rejections from editors that said, this is set in 2012, we're done with that now. Like, no one's homophobic. Um, <laughs> Yeah, little did they know what was about to happen. And no one gets mad when lesbian people marry men. Oh, yeah. no, no, um, no. Oh, yeah. Oh, God. Um, yeah, all these ways in which we were police, like, even editors, um, was there was a 
gay editor who rejected my book because he said that people don't struggle with that anymore. People don't struggle with the closet anymore. And I was like, what kind of bubble do you live in? I just don't, I just didn't, don't understand. Um, but yeah, like I, I think, I think it's, that's hard to uh, like explain these particular cultural experiences to people who don't have them. Um, like just like it's hard to explain particularities of South Asian like parents and children and how they interact to somebody who has not had that experience. Like in Blue Skin Gods, right? Mm -hmm. When I, I read Blue Skin Gods and I was automatically thinking about um, oh, Artie the Aqua Boy, Geek Love. And I was thinking about how there was a father who manipulated his children mm -hmm. for gain in that one. And I wondered, because of course I don't know, but I wondered like, well, but we're talking about different parenting ethos and we're talking mm -hmm. about different expectations of children. You don't ever explain that for your reader, right? Yeah. It's like, mm -hmm. Google it if you want to find out. Yeah, there are some things I don't feel like I need to explain <laughs> um, that I think are, are, are not just, South, I mean, those are things that I, I think are not just South Asian though. It's like, it's, it's a wide enough cultural phenomenon that many people actually relate to that kind of uh, parent-child relationship or that kind of community dynamic when like, the extended community is like having is able to put pressure on parents to act in a particular way toward their children. Uh, a lot of communities do that, mm -hmm. um, so it's it's something that I have to make clear. I think, but also, um, I don't I don't think I need to explain it. I just need to make the stakes clear. You know, I came of age in the 80s, right? So a lot of like lesbian fiction writing and a lot of mm -hmm. we explained a lot. Yeah. Right? And it's okay. I mean, we did a, g a thing in literature that it was of a time and a place, but I think we lost something that is not lost mm -hmm. in something like Gothhouse. You're really good at one-liners. Again, I can't <laughs> give them away because you have to read the book, but there are some one-lines that are really devastating. And I'm, I'm curious, do you ever have stories come to you as like that one line and you think, oh, I have to write a story to use that? Sometimes. Um, usually it's the first line that comes to me in a short story or in a novel. Um, but sometimes I'll be stuck and stuck and stuck for days. And then that one line will come to me and I'm like, oh, okay. That's, that's what I need to write next. Can you tell us a line from Blue Skin Gods? We have to stop, but that might be... No, I don't. I, I don't. I can't think I would tell you my line from here, but I can't because <laughs> I haven't read it yet. Actually, what um, my... Sometimes my partner gives me lines because he is a poet, and um, sometimes uh, the lo the most quoted lines from my books are his, <laughs> 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 or ones we co-wrote, and he never gets credit. <laughs> oh, but he appears <laughs> as a character. So he does. <laughs> Bex has given me the heads up. So I I yeah. do you have anything you wanted to get asked that you didn't get asked? Uh, no, thank you for reading my work so closely. Thank you for helping me write some of this. Um, yeah, and thank you all for coming. This has been wonderful. Thank you, independent bookstores. Yes, thank you. Yay. And thank you, Lily, for organizing this. Thank you. Um, thank you all again for coming out and being with us here tonight. Uh, thank you, Sindhu and Tony. Um, a reminder, again, we have books for you to buy uh, for yourself, for your friends. The holidays are in three months, but guess what? It's holiday season at the bookstore. Um, we've got Blue Skin Gods. We've got Goth House Experiment. Cindy's going to come sign them over where Christina, my lovely coworker, is pointing. We've got like a little saloon door for you all to line up up. Um, and my other coworker, Julia, is going to come through with post-it notes and get all your names. And it's going to be great if you're still with us on the live stream buy that book hit that link description um again thank you all so much for coming out tonight and please grab your belongings as you head out and have a great evening <laughs> <laughs>